In every dystopian novel or movie I can think of, there is either an oppressive government or a government not functioning at all. As we travel this road of life, we should be asking ourselves if any action we take will lead to more liberty or more control. Take, for example, central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs for short. Would this new currency allow Americans more liberty, or would it give government more control over our lives? To understand this, we first need to look at what CBDCs are, then we need to answer a couple of questions. First, would an American CBDC be constitutional? Second, let's look at this proverbial digital coin and decide for ourselves, do the benefits outweigh the costs. So we'll do that next on the Constitution Study. Hello there, Everyday Americans. Paul Engel here with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution we teach the rising generation to be free. I'm glad you could join me. You know, CBDCs are a bit of a controversial subject, and I'm, I'm not talking about any specific legislation, but I wanted to talk about the, the fundamentals, the background. So hopefully this is something you find interesting, something you find useful. If you want to find more, if you want to share this, go to the website constitutionstudy.com. I'll talk more about the website and what's going on in the next few weeks at the end of the episode. But for now, let's take a look at what an American CBDC would look like. The main difference between digital currencies and what most people think of as currency is physical existence. The current dollar is a physical currency. You can hold it in your hand, either as coins or bills. You can trade it with others or store it for later use. A digital currency only exists in a digital form, meaning there are only numbers on a ledger somewhere and can only be traded via computer or other electronic device like a smartphone. Now, digital currencies should not be confused with payment apps like Venmo or PayPal or with credit or debit cards. All current payment options, whether digital or physical, are trading in physical dollars created by the Federal Reserve, though that's a good place to get an understanding of how an American CBDC would work. In today's economy, the Federal Reserve, America's central bank, creates money digitally. They don't create a digital currency, but they create money by making changes in a digital ledger, then buying bonds from the U.S. Treasury in the same amount. In effect, the Fed creates money to loan to the federal government through the U.S. Treasury. This money then enters the economy through the reserve banks, where other banks can borrow what is known as the federal funds rate. This is the interest rate we keep hearing about when the news reports the, the Fed's raising or lowering interest rates. Now, when you go to your local bank for a loan, they give you the money from their assets and, if necessary, borrow additional money from the Federal Reserve to keep themselves liquid. The important difference between the money the Fed creates out of thin air and the digital currency we've been talking about is you can always convert your money into physical cash, which you cannot do with digital currency. Now, when I was a child living in New York City, I was not allowed to leave the house without a dime in my pocket. Yes, a payphone in New York City was only a dime when I was a child. This is an example of physical currency we're all familiar with. Just like any physical currency, it has its drawbacks. It can be lost or stolen, and it can be quite inconvenient when dealing with large sums of money or when trying to get change from that teenager working behind the counter. When I was a child, certain businesses would extend credit to good customers to make life easier. Don't worry about carrying cash or making change. Simply charge it to your account, then pay the bill at the end of the month. This too was inconvenient since you had to pay each business separately and it didn't work at places where you had not previously set up an account. Then credit cards entered the scene. The first credit cards, Diners Club, were given out in 1950, yes, before I was even born, and were only accepted at a handful of restaurants around New York City. This idea exploded and today, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of companies offering credit cards. Now, on its face, a credit card is a simple thing. When you purchase something on a credit card, the credit card company pays that business minus a fee. Then at the end of the month, you get a bill from the credit card company showing all of the charges you have made, and you write them one check. Now, this is quite a convenience, especially in today's mobile and online society. 
After all, you can't exactly put a bunch of $20 bills into your computer when you purchase something at Amazon. I still remember when I first entered the business world, my father recommended I get an American Express card because that's what businessmen did. They are accepted all over the world and they have no fixed spending limit, which is very helpful when you have to fly to San Jose with very little notice. Like anything else though, credit cards have their downside. The fees charged by the merchant banks that process the credit card transactions can become quite expensive, driving the cost of goods higher. I still remember when gas stations used to charge different prices when you paid in cash or with a charge. The second problem is that these card companies are extending credit to their users. This made it harder for young people just entering the market with no credit history to get a credit card. Enter the debit card. In 1966, the Bank of Delaware issued the first debit card. It works similar to a credit card, except the company doesn't extend you credit for the purchase. They deduct it directly from your bank account. For that reason, debit cards are generally used by banks or other institutions where you keep your money. This direct withdrawal from your account solved the credit issue, but not the cost of accepting these cards. However, their convenience has led to the widespread adoption not only of accepting credit and debit cards, but using them instead of cash, even for small purchases. Credit and debit cards are not a form of digital currency. When you use plastic to pay for things, the currency is still dollars, yen, or British pounds. Also, you are doing business with your bank or credit card company, not the government. If you've ever looked at the little terminals you use for a credit card purchase, you've seen authorizing pop up on the screen. This is the terminal contacting the business's payment center to make sure they will get their money. If you don't have sufficient funds or credit on your account, your purchase will be declined. Now, the ubiquity of the use of credit and debit cards have helped create the situation where digital currencies can flourish. The other phenomena leading to the push for CBDCs was the explosion of cryptocurrencies. In response to the lax monetary policies created by Congress, people have always looked for ways to protect themselves from the volatility and inflation of government fiat currencies. A fiat currency is one not backed by physical assets such as gold or silver. The problem is most alternatives involve physical assets which have the same problems as cash, which gave rise to the cryptocurrency. In 1983, cryptographer David Chalm proposed a form of electronic cash, a token currency that could be transferred between individuals safely and privately. Chalm founded DigiCast in 1990 and created the first cryptographic currency called eCash. Although DigiCash went bankrupt in 1998, the encryption tools played an important role in the development of today's cryptocurrencies. Not all digital currencies are cryptocurrencies. The Bitcoin and Ethereum most people are familiar with use cryptography to both secure and verify each transaction. Cryptography is also used to create and manage the currency itself. The biggest advantage of cryptocurrencies to date is that they do not involve any government entities. When you make a digital transaction using a credit or debit card, you are still transferring dollars created and managed by the federal government. Not so with most cryptocurrencies. Now, attempts have been made to create a cryptocurrency based on the US dollar, but they've been unsuccessful. There are several practical disadvantages to cryptocurrencies though. First, the cost of creating the currency is quite high, which helps lead to the second disadvantage, volatility. If you wish to trade in cryptocurrencies, you better have nerves of steel, as the value of a single Bitcoin or Ethereum token can change by thousands of dollars in a single day or even a single hour. The last disadvantage I want to bring up today is more technical. See, every cryptocurrency I know of uses a blockchain as its ledger. The cryptography necessary for the blockchain to work requires a significant amount of computing power. For this reason, anyone using a blockchain has to balance how frequently the chain updates with the cost of the computing power needed for those updates. For that reason, most large-scale blockchains I'm familiar with only update every 5 to 15 minutes. Most people I know don't want to be standing in the checkout line at the grocery store for 5 minutes while their cryptocurrency transaction gets posted to the blockchain. Now, from a government point of view, cryptocurrencies pose a problem. The government can't see what's going on. Most of you probably know that any transaction over $10,000 is reported by the bank to the IRS. 
You may even know that it is considered a federal crime to structure your deposits to remain under the $10,000 threshold. Recently, the IRS has been warning people that transactions over $600 through online payment facilities like PayPal or Venmo will also be reported to the IRS. All of this under the guise of preventing money laundering and financial terrorism. That means the federal government is surveilling as many of your financial transactions as they think they can get away with. But what happens if cryptocurrencies find a way to mitigate their disadvantages or people just get fed up with the ongoing surveillance state? They may start doing business in crypto and leave old Uncle Sam in the dark. Enter central bank digital currencies. Before getting into the details, there's a question we need to answer. Would an American CBDC be constitutional? Well, under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 of the Constitution, Congress has the power to coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. Like so many words in the English language, their meaning is dependent on the context and on the part of speech. In the phrase, to coin money, the word coin is a verb, meaning to stamp a metal and convert it into money. To make as to coin words, or to make as to forge, to fabricate. That means that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 delegates to Congress the power to make money, including a digital currency. Now, there are some real advantages to a digital currency. Much like a credit or debit card, it would be easy and convenient to use. Since most of our credit and debit cards have chips on them, I wouldn't be surprised if early versions of an American digital currency would be issued on the exact same type of card you're used to. Of course, there would also be an app for your phone, but using a currency on a card would be both familiar and help calm any fears many people would have about requiring the use of a smartphone or smartwatch for all of your transactions. Since a digital currency would not have the cryptographic overhead of a cryptocurrency, the transactions would be faster, not just in person, but for anything you pay for, like mortgages, utility bills, or buying a car from a neighbor. No worries about the check bouncing or having to wait days for it to clear. Digital currencies would also be cheaper with no transaction fees to be paid. While some proponents point to saving money on wire transfers, that's something I don't think most Americans use regularly. So this points to the largest disadvantage of CBDCs. When you use a credit card, a debit card, payment app, or wire transfer, you are dealing with a bank or credit card company. When you use a CBDC, you are dealing directly with the Federal Reserve. That's right. Each and every transaction you make with a CBDC will be recorded by the Federal Reserve and therefore be known to the federal government. Remember when you saw authorizing on your payment terminal? Well, with a credit card, debit card, or payment app, that was the system checking with your bank or credit card to authorize the purchase. What happens though when it's the federal government that's doing the authorizing? Do you remember when Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau froze the bank accounts of truckers for peacefully protesting COVID lockdowns? Proponents of CBDCs claim these concerns can be mitigated by not making their use mandatory. Now take a look at recent history. Do you really believe that governments won't outlaw the use of other currencies? Back in 1971, then-President Richard Nixon ordered his Treasury Secretary, John Connolly, to suspend the ability of foreign banks to exchange dollars for gold. This was the end of dollars being attached to the price of gold, or as is more commonly known, the gold standard. What would stop a future president from simply issuing an executive order to prevent federal departments from accepting or paying with anything other than an American digital currency? Based on recent actions in response to COVID-19, I would expect just about any president to issue an executive order demanding that companies with more than 100 employees only do business in digital dollars. Now, imagine you are making a purchase using your digital dollar. That authorizing message has new meaning as you wait to see if the federal government will authorize your purchase. Unfortunately, that won't be the end of it. Suppose the Federal Reserve decides to implement a negative interest rate. How can you protect your money from these federal raiders if you are required to keep your money in accounts they hold? Imagine going to purchase something only to find that some percentage of your bank account disappears every month. Imagine the federal government decides to fine you for misinformation. You know, like PayPal tried. No trial, no due process, just 
money gone from your account. Poof. And in the midst of this, you have no place to go. Sure, you could probably trade in gold and silver on the black market, but wouldn't you expect Congress to pass a law calling that money laundering or, or financial terrorism? Should the United States implement a CBDC, then the failure of the Republic would be complete. All it would take is the Fed refusing to honor cash and everyone would be forced to do business with one bank, the Federal Reserve. We would look more like communist China than the country created by the framers of the Constitution. This experiment in self-government will have failed. And the answer Benjamin Franklin gave to what kind of government have you given us will haunt our ears. A republic, if you can keep it. In the coming months and years, there will be plenty of hype about the praises of wonders of a digital currency. You know, you don't have to carry around cash or credit cards or, or just, you know, one little thing. And it, by the way, it's secure and it's protected and all that wonderful stuff. Very few people will talk about the downsides of an American digital currency. The lack of privacy, the lack of control, the ability of the government to raid your funds at any time for any reason. <laughs> oh, sure, you could sue, but you're going to ask the government to give your money back? This is a very dangerous time. And these are very dangerous things. In fact, some of my more biblically minded people say it's, well, it's from the book of Revelations. Regardless of, of what you think, CBDCs will effectively destroy the republic. Because no matter who you choose to be in office, the government will be in control of your life. Freedom and liberty will be gone. You'll have whatever rights and freedoms the government deems to let you exercise. And if they don't like your exercise of that right, they can simply punish you by locking up your account. You can't exactly go to a bank or, or, or go to a, a mattress full of cash if it all has to be in these digital currencies controlled by the federal government. CBDCs are about control. There's one thing we should have learned from COVID-19. Once government gets control, they don't like to let go. Facts and, and data and science don't really matter as long as they get their way. So I hope you'll fight against the digital currency as the push for one keeps going. Now, if you like this type of information, please check out the website, constitutionstudy.com. Now, through New Year's, I have 20% off of all of my books. Also, 20% off of my Made in Tennessee t-shirts. So please, check it out. Everything you buy there, all the profits go to keep this program alive. It's how I pay for the software to make this all this stuff work. And if you want to donate to help the cause, well, you can do that as well. There's a button right on the homepage to donate. You can donate to one of my programs or just to the Constitution study itself. As we get to the end of the year and I'm looking at the books, anything you do to help would be greatly appreciated. And of course, this information is so important. I hope you'll share it. I hope you'll let other people, friends, family know about the dangers of CBDCs and all the other things I we talk about here on the Constitution study. Sharing the word is how we spread the blessings of liberty by spreading those seeds of knowledge that comes from actually reading and studying the Constitution. Now, hopefully you found this program worth your time. Hopefully you'll bring some friends here the next time we get together at the Constitution Study.